I'm Eric Christian Olson. I'm here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change and the Environmental Media Association, where I serve on the executive board, which sounds super fancy, but trust me, it's not. But this is part of an amazing series called EMA Talks Real Science, in which we aim to give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on important climate equity, environmental, and public health issues. Today, we have an amazing conversation I'm so excited about with Dr. Mary Bissett and Theaster Gates on racism as a public health crisis and solutions for change. Dr. Mary Bissett is the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, as well as the FXB Professor of Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. With more than 30 years of experience in public health, Dr. Mary Travis Bissett has dedicated her career to advancing health equity. Prior to her directorship at the FXB Center, Dr. Bissett served for four years as the Commissioner of Health for New York City. As commissioner, she worked to ensure that every New York City neighborhood supported the health of its residents with the goal of closing gaps in population health across the entire city. Theastra Gates is an artist, an educator, and a social innovator who lives and works in Chicago. Gates creates work that focuses on space theory and land development, sculpture, and performance. Drawing on his interest in training in urban planning and preservation, Gates redeems places that have been left behind. Gates is a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Visual Arts. Uh, if you haven't seen the show on Apple TV Plus called Home, uh, the episode, I think it's number three, entitled Chicago, is all about theaster. You have to watch it. It's such a window into this man's soul and his heart and his philosophy and POV and it is nothing short of spectacular. I couldn't be more excited to hand it off to Theaster, and thank you guys so much for, for having this conversation. It's so good to see you. Thanks for making time today. It's really a pleasure to be here, and such a pleasure to meet you. Um, the, the, for the last few days, I've been trying to look at and read everything that I've seen you do, and I have to admit that I've fallen in love with you and your work and the tremendous uh, courage it takes to speak truth to government and large uh, medical institutions and, and other forms of power. Well, so, thank you. Thank well, you I so try much. to be a worthy representative of the many people who fought and paid for fighting to give someone like me these opportunities. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been hearing so much in the media um, that racism uh, is a public health crisis. Uh, and, and, and you've talked a lot about that. I was wondering if you could explain what you mean by that. Sure. Well, the first thing to say is that the United States is deeply divided by race. I think that this is broadly accepted by everyone. And these divisions uh, are reflected not only in our laws and our housing policies and educational access and, attend and attainment in the labor market, they're written on our bodies and reflected in our health and our ability to live a healthy life span. Uh, I often say, and it's true, this is a fact, not an opinion, mm. that there has not been a single year uh, since the United States uh, collected vital statistics when people of African descent in this country haven't been sicker and died younger. Uh, than people who are classified as white. Mm -hmm. So that is because of racism. Uh, it's not because we you know, can break it down by saying it's because people smoke too much or they don't get enough exercise or those things are not uh, sufficiently explanatory. Mm -hmm. The reason that we've seen this replicated over generations is because of the racial hierarchy in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so we're in a okay, crisis now. Uh, and it, it's not, in many ways, it's a crisis that ex exposes the, the historical crisis. Right. And this COVID pandemic is a, a once in a century event. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, massive. Right. And as we began to understand how it was spreading through our population, large racial inequities be, have become apparent. And then on May 25th, uh, we had the public um, execution of uh, George Floyd 
uh, an extrajudicial killing by police. And that also brought to the fore the fact that racism affects everything, including the likelihood of having a fatal encounter uh, with, with police. Yeah, it, it feels, uh, I mean, when you look at the, the kind of blatant violence that's happened against black and brown bodies, it becomes evident that the, the rate, it makes evident the real racial break, but people really don't consider that when you go to the hospital, there might be a problem. And so, you know, I feel like COVID-19 has shed light on the disproportionate health burdens um, that racism creates in the United States. You have essential um, workforce and black communities that are hardest hit. Yeah. Um, but what do we know about um, the inequities uh, associated with this impact? Where are the gaps in our research and in our understanding? Wow. Well, to be honest with you, the idea that racism affects our health remains controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, people are more willing to say, you know, it's bad for your health to be poor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they, you know, are, are resistant still, I think, to saying that it's a directly an effect of racism. And we see it and what happens to people in their neighborhoods, where I know you, you've done a lot of work. And that's probably the most important place where people's health is determined. Yeah. And it also, we see it once people get to the hospital or yeah. in their ability to get to the hospital, whether they trust the hospital, whether they have the resources to get there, to pay for their care and how they'll be treated uh, by, the, by the healthcare delivery system. Race filters through all of that. I have a small anecdote. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm teaching at University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I went in for um, a kind of annual men's checkup. Mm -hmm. A young white doctor, a uh, female uh, came and she was doing my checkup and I said, hey, I'd like you to, you know, look at my body and check my vitals and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, make sure that I'm good. I have a good bill of health all over. And um, the doctor left the room and she talked to another nurse and she said, you know, I just got married and I'm just not comfortable uh, touching this guy. Wow. And she didn't, she didn't know who I was or whatever, but, but I, it struck me so much. It, it, it was really uh, kind of interesting and complicated because um, her, her main anxiety was maybe part I was male. Yeah. But, but uh, by, by and large that I was black and kind of unidentifiably poor, middle-class, rich, I was unidentifiable, you know? And, uh, and, and to feel that bias when I feel like I've worked really hard to work against the possibility of biases was, was um, kind, of, kind of shocking. Well, know? that's re really, it also speaks to this notion um, that's so widespread in our society that black people, particularly black men, are a source of danger mm -hmm. and have to be, you know, somehow controlled. And, and I'm sorry that that happened, but I suspect if you ask any person of African descent, they'll have a story like that. Well, when and, I, you say I mean, that these things, I, these have happened to me as well. Yeah. Um, I had, I, I, I'm a medical doctor by training and one of my, you know, and I was, if we found a way into it, I was going to ask you about your time in South Africa. I lived in Zimbabwe for, for over 20 years and, um, and my, one of my daughters got malaria on a visit and they just wouldn't believe that I was a doctor. I yeah. took her, you know, they just wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I kept telling them I'm a doctor. Yeah, uh, I've probably seen more malaria than you have. I'm sure she has malaria and they wouldn't believe it. And, you know, this happened to somebody on an airplane recently who, you know, was asked somehow to prove that she was a physician. Anyway, uh, this is an example yeah. about how, how race cuts across class, right? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 regardless of your in socioeconomic status or your educational level, uh, people of African descent and people of color more broadly are going to experience things differently. And this is wrong. And it's also not biological. 
it's social in origin. And that's why the slogan, racism is a public health uh, uh, crisis, and so far it is a slogan, uh, is important because we can change this. Yeah. That's the good news about it not being related to our bodies, but really related to how our societies treat our bodies. Yeah. Mary, let's, let's talk about data for a second. Mm -hmm. Data uh, is important and helps inform policymaking. Uh, in the context of COVID-19 or other health impacts, can you talk a bit about the dangers of lacking accurate racial data and how we can better collect and report data to make sure we have an accurate picture of what's happening around the country, around the world. Right. Well, this has been very true during COVID. Uh, when the, um, I mean, I, I have to divert a little bit to say we've just never seen public health leadership under such attack. Yeah. Uh, but the federal government, the Centers for Disease Control, didn't release race-specific data. The first evidence that we had of excess mortality and excess infection among uh, pop Black and Latinx populations and indigenous peoples, a horrible outbreak on the Navajo and Navajo land. Um, the, um, the, the first information came from local authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it was Milwaukee, which is the first jurisdiction I've ever heard of declaring racism a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. They reported out of their first 15 cases of COVID deaths uh, statewide, Eight were in Milwaukee, and all eight were among African Americans, and the journalists picked it up. It wasn't the public health authorities that were putting out the data. Now, that's gotten a lot better yes. as evidence that it was possible, uh, but it took uh, a public outcry. It took electeds demanding that these data be made available, and it matters because if we can't track it, we can't really speak to it. And these data are really important to, uh, to identifying who, you know, which, what populations are being affected. So the data are now available, uh, but not as much as I'd like. Right. Uh, you know, we still can't look at it separately by gender, for example, by race and gender. We can't look at educational attainment, you know, which we were talking about earlier, you're a professor, I'm a professor, what's happening to people who have high school or less? We can't look at that okay. uh, because the data, although they exist on death certificates, haven't been made publicly available. So I always say that these data are the, are the platform. Uh, and right now, uh, they're being made more available by journalists filing freedom of information requests than they are by public health authorities. And that's wrong. Uh, it's a real shame. Yeah, there, there are moments when I feel like um, the Department of Public Health needs a slightly more journalistic approach, mm -hmm. uh, a, a kind of curiosity, a, a, a national curiosity that exposed, not for the sake of punishing anyone, mm -hmm. but for the sake of gaining information about how to make uh, the lives of our nation, uh, the people of our nation better. Right. You know? I, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, there's this notion that to talk about these data is a form of, uh, of a vendetta. Yeah. I was reeling off lots of statistics. The rate of dying before the age of 65 in general is, uh, is much higher for people of African descent than whites, and it's much higher now during COVID as well, dying of COVID. And the person interviewing me said, you sound very angry. Mm. Uh, and I said, I thought I was just re relating facts. <laughs> and, you know, that's part of the issue. Yes. That the, the data do tell a story that there's resistance to, to learning about. And they tell a story by neighborhood as well. Um, you know, I, I know you've been really interested in neighborhoods, and I, I live in Roxbury, which is sort of the Harlem of Boston. Yes. And I live in an area of Roxbury that's gentrifying. I'm, I'm probably among the gentrifiers. So I was walking, I swim at the local Y mm -hmm. in the mornings, and I was walking, and the, the neighborhood changes as I walk, and thinking that I was going to be talking to you I thought about, you know, what are the things that show me that I'm leaving 
uh, you know, a more affluent section and going into a poor section. Mm -hmm. I, I would have told you in the past, it's like seeing check cashing signs, right. uh, which is proof that people don't have, are unbanked, as they say, they don't have bank accounts. Yeah. But it's also trash collection, tree yeah. coverage, yes. you know, um, it, it's, um, you know, there are other, other things uh, that let you know that this is a neighborhood that is being neglected. Yes. And uh, I just, I, if I can turn it a little bit to you and just ask, how do you think about this with your kind of visual eye? Uh, what makes you know that a neighborhood is one that has been, um, you know, subjected to bad policies and, um, and as a result, uh, a less healthy place to be? Yeah, well, it, it's reasonable to say that a, a big part of my practice was born because in high school I started to recognize what felt like a kind of spatialized racism. You know, um, uh, imagine I was I was in um, I was starting high school in the mid '80s, and uh, I remember just going to high school, like on my way to high school, these buildings were being torn down at a very rap rapid pace in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and the policy at the time was like if drug activity was happening and the building wasn't occupied by an owner or a, 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 a tenant, that um, if it was selling illicit drugs out of that building, the building would just be torn down. And, and you know, some would say 25 to 30% of the housing stock on, on Chicago's South Side and West Side was torn down in this period where um, uh, bulldozing was the only measure used to counteract um, a, a drug drug activity. But it would just kind of push the drug activity somewhere else. And it also left us without building. And, and so they, they kind of made do with just kind of the destruction of the architectural fabric of a neighborhood. So, so I think that in my case, I decided that I would try to restore those buildings bring um bring beauty back to the architectural fabric of the neighborhood that i live in replant the trees on the parkway and then in, in, in a way if it was um 1970s where there was both a, a white flight and a black flight how do you begin to stabilize these neighborhoods and then have a return of people of color to neighborhoods that they left because the neighborhoods weren't beautiful they didn't feel safe and the schools weren't as good as they wanted. And so right. and what I realized was that no matter where you live, there's work to do. Mm. And so if I would just plant myself in a neighborhood and try to plant as much beauty around me, that beauty could function as the kind of trigger or catalyst for other kinds of local investment. And uh, I didn't know if it was true, but it, in my case, it happened to have worked that people want to live in this part of the South Side again in a way that I never could have imagined a decade ago. That's really, uh, I, I mean, I, I really love the fact that, um, you know, we, we think of beauty and sometimes even art as sort of decorative. Yes. And, uh, you know, an extra if we have the resources and the time. But what your work has shown and, and in the way you're talking about beauty. Uh, makes it clear that it's really part of human existence. We we need beauty, not just it's not just uh, an extra, but it's also obviously related to health. There was somebody who just did a study. Um, you know, the world is getting hotter and hotter, and um, so tree coverage is increasingly important to keeping um, you know keeping neighborhoods cool. And they just did, somebody just did a study showing that sure. heat islands uh, are related to neighborhoods that were historically redlined. Um, so, you know, yes. these are the neighborhoods where people couldn't get mortgages, couldn't own their own homes. And this happened, you know, nearly 80 years ago. Uh, but we still see these same neighborhoods have all kinds of social um, burdens, uh, including uh, lower life expectancies anyway. Uh, so planting those trees is good for the uh, beauty of the neighborhood, and it's also going to help keep them cooler and safer uh, and help uh, 
communities be more resilient to climate change. Um, Absolutely. Not that there aren't other things we should be doing about no, climate I, change. I totally agree that, that uh, one of the things I recall as a young person was a kind of psychological trauma. Like there were certain blocks that I didn't want to walk down because they didn't feel good and they didn't feel good because they didn't look good, you know? So, uh, so I'll admit that when I use the term beauty, uh, I'm, I'm actually talking about a code. It's a, it's a much more complex intent. Mm -hmm. That beauty is actually, what, what are the social, spiritual, and economic intentionalities needed mm -hmm. in order to make a place and the people of a place better, mm -hmm. right? And so even though the word beauty is not, I'm not talking about just painting murals, right. I'm talking about the synagogues and the churches and the youth centers, yeah. you know, the things that make every neighborhood great, yeah. you know, swimming pool, public amenities. And, and those things require money, yeah. political power and persuasiveness, strong uh, uh, block clubs and community centers and community leaders. And so in order to get to this affect of beauty, it's not something that one does alone. Right. And, and if I were to try to, to say that um, whether it's health disparities or beauty disparities, mm -hmm. that those things require strong collaborations uh, among, uh, among community members and a, and a real belief that health and beauty are important um, to a healthy society. Yeah, you know? yeah. I couldn't believe, I couldn't agree more. And, and I have to just comment that public health and urban planning had similar roots historically. Yeah. Yes. And some of the biggest successes in public health have been literally structural. Yeah. Meaning uh, sidewalks, setbacks of buildings, ventilation, Number of sanitation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about Jane Addams all the time, like these moments where you demonstrate that the challenges that we have is not necessarily that people are bad people, but the, the conditions by which we've been put in urban space didn't allow for um, us to be healthy. Right, and often that was racially segmented, racially, tar you know, who got to uh, have, uh, even Jane Addams, as venerated as she is, and, uh, and she, you know, she had one of the first playgrounds for children, the, all, all wonderful things, but she really didn't have confidence that um, that black people could respond to her efforts. She Absolutely. thought European immigrants, who were her principal targets, had the kind of cultural background, and these kind of racist beliefs have really torn through a lot. And they're, as I've said, <laughs> they are reflected in 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 our health profiles. Um, and I, I really have to echo what you've said about social movements. And, uh, and, and, and by that, I mean not just national movements, but as you say, very local mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood movements have always been um, uh, critical to advancing health. It's not just technical information, which we need. We need yeah. a vaccine for COVID. But we need also, you know, communities that will accept this vaccine, that will, uh, you know, adopt the other protective maneuvers. And that requires leadership, as you say, and trust and uh, a belief that, that communities have the ability to protect their residents, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is har hard to feel if you have a bulldozer, you know, like showing up as the principal bulldozers and police as the principal signs of state engagement with your community, you know, when the government is there like that, it's hard for people to believe they have power. Yeah. I really want to, I really found an, an informative what you said about beauty, that yeah. beauty is not only uh, about, you know, murals or yeah. public art. Yeah. It, it, I, I, when I think, you know, I, I grew up uh, in Upper Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And um, and the Harlem of my childhood was crowded. Yeah, there were on hot summer days, people were out with card tables on the sidewalks, and there were eyes on the street yeah. all the time. Yes, and I felt safe there. Yeah. When I first got as a met as a, I was still a college student, thinking about going to medical school, I, I I was staying on the Upper East Side, which is a Tony neighborhood. 
and the streets at night are empty. And I felt terrified <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, walking mm -hmm. down those streets. So it's not only, um, you know, what we would go, it's the sense of a vibrant functioning community uh, where people keep an Absolutely. eye on each other and not just the, you know, the level of upkeep of the buildings um, yeah. that well, you, constitutes beauty. So that really was a helpful remark to me. Well, if you, when you think about the board of the Met or the creation of the shed or, mm -hmm. you know, the extension uh, uh, of, of the high line of the high line mm -hmm. that in all of these cases and these are cases where if you were to look at what constitutes beauty what you're talking about is extremely wealthy influential people who can't live without culture right. and are willing to leverage their political relationships their real estate ownings their um, intelligence their knowledge of the law in order to create vibrancy. Yeah. And so if we're willing to do this, if we, all, if we already understand the formula that um, you know, Chelsea is gonna be a more walkable place and a more beautiful place if the high line is there, mm -hmm. then, then it's really just a matter of applying that knowledge that we have to places that happen to be of color and poor. Right, yes, There's absolutely. Some, and yeah. I, I don't know how they do it, but they, these places that you've just mentioned somehow signify to people of color that you're, this isn't really your place. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know how, I, I don't know how they do it because. Um, so we we need to think about that that too. But we we you're absolutely right that that um, it it really shouldn't be only wealthy neighborhoods that have the ability to to bring community building. So public spaces uh, to to their environments. Uh, I I really second that. Mary, in your recently published op-ed in New York Daily News, "Racism is a Deadly Virus Too: A Public Health Defense of These Masked Protests," um, you talk about the false equivalency of public health experts comparing anti-racism protests um, to anti-lockdown protests over concerns that they will increase the spread of COVID-19 and worsen existing racial, ethnic, and economic inequalities in COVID-19 deaths. Right. Why are the anti-racist protests different? Well, for several reasons. Um, and, uh, and these protests were the largest that have ever been documented around the globe. Millions of people. Uh, came out to express their alarm, their sorrow, and their insistence that this stop uh, in response to the, to the killing of George, of George Floyd. And so people were saying, uh, look, you know, you're not being responsible in public health. Uh, public demonstrations in the time of COVID are too risky. They're going to be spreading COVID. And, you know, you condemn these anti-lockdown protests. Why aren't you condemning the protests against George Floyd? Mm -hmm. And one thing is that these protests uh, against the George Floyd killing uh, were, they made every effort to, um, you know, to, to adopt protective maneuvers. My, I, I didn't participate in them, uh, but my, one of my daughters did. And she said that they told people like, spread your arms out, uh, this is, you know, you should stay this far apart. Uh, they handed out hand sanitizer and masks, whereas these anti-lockdown uh, were against the protective man maneuvers. That, that's what they, you know, they proudly, no masks, no protection. And that's a big difference. The, also, the purpose uh, was to say that racism is killing people, which is a fact. And the, you know, that's why they were willing uh, to take a risk because this, uh, and they were, you know, there've been more deaths that have followed. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not over. And uh, that's why I uh, wrote that with my colleagues at the School of Public Health. And now it's been some time after and there's no evidence that the protests um, uh, around uh, police killings of, of of particularly black people 
uh, led to any spike in COVID transmission. Uh, whereas these unmasked, anti-masked, I mean, it's just unthinkable what's happened with uh, that, like it's practically a sign of your political affiliation to wear a mask. I mean, what's up with that? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's, uh, so um, it, they're just very different. And, uh, it is an and, and, and one carries much higher health risk. Yeah. Uh, it, it has been interesting to, to, to imagine that people are willing to uh, just uh, make equal the form, which is the protest, and say, oh, well, you know, it, it, and, I, and I really think that the, the, um, the ambition of um, especially the kind of Black Lives Matters uh, this moment mm -hmm. where people are trying to develop um, a platform that internationally raises the flag that there is a challenge in our world mm -hmm. that is related to complexion, right. you know, and that, that in a way uh, race has become the mitigator for having access and not having access for so many. Right. But in, the, in this moment, also kind of imagining that the, the challenges of um, people feeling infringed upon, they feel asked to try to make the world safer by wearing a mask. And, and that this, this, this false sense of civil liberty uh, could really translate in some cases in a kind of uh, national recklessness. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and this has always been a, a, a tension in public health that, that public health, um, you know, says that we have an obligation to protect all of us. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's why, you know, anti-smoking rules were extended uh, because, it's, you know, arguably you can take the decision to smoke, but if your secondhand smoke will kill someone else and they, they have the right to be protected mm -hmm. from your dis personal decision to smoke. And similarly, um, you know, the mask is really to protect other people from you. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you, you know, you have the right to feel however you want to, but you still have a social obligation. If we think of ourselves as one nation, that we all care about each other, uh, to protect other people in the event that we have, the, have been infected with this new virus. So that, you know, the, um, it, it, it really is frightening to see this libertarian strain overlap with notions of white supremacy with the fact that uh, essential workers became uh, uh, you know, infected uh, because they continue to work outside of the home and not talking about doctors, yeah. talking about people who drive the buses, deliver our packages, stock our supermarket shelves, work in the warehouses. These are largely low wage jobs yes. that are occupied by people who are largely black and Hispanic. Uh, this is how racism works. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, um, the fact is that these, these excess risks made some people think, well, those are the people who are going to get this, mm -hmm. not us, right. not true. That's right. And we don't actually really want to prove that. Yeah. From what I've heard about this, having this disease, I don't wish it on anybody. Yes. So, you know, but the fact is that our, all of our bodies are susceptible to this virus and who gets infected uh, or not has to do with the kind of life that we have. And, you know, we're now seeing it spread into the so-called heartland, but this notion that black bodies are different than other people's bodies are, is rooted in racist beliefs Yes. Uh, but it's dangerous for all of us. Yes. And that's, you know, that's yeah. part of the whole story, too. So, you know, I'm thinking you, you have over 30 years experience in the healthcare field. Mm. Um, what do you see as a path forward during a time that we're battling a pandemic as, as well as we're battling the issues of systemic racism. Both are critical to public health. What can we do um, to, to kind of 
right these wrongs? Well, this is not a small question that you've asked um, because these wrongs um, were built into our nation's founding. Uh, so this is something that we need to make a collective decision as a society that we're going to address it. But right now, mm -hmm. uh, we can first say that the risk of COVID-19 is not simply a matter of personal behavior. It has to do with the fact that people need to have access to paid sick leave so that if they get sick, they don't keep going to work because they need to make that money and risk infecting their colleagues. We need universal access to yes. health care yes. uh, so that people aren't afraid to, of the bill that they'll get for going to the hospital. And we need uh, you know, people to have protections at work, uh, people who worked in nursing homes, which were really the you know, the epicenter, 40% of deaths that occurred in these, this setting so far. Uh, we, you know, many of the people who work there are very low wage, have to work multiple jobs, and they receive no protections because people were just worried about the hospital. So we, those are immediate things that we can do. And of course, each of us does have actions that we can take. Sure. We should wear masks. We should stay away from other people, especially if we're older which you are not yet in that category, but I am. And, you know, and we should wash our hands. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, if you live in a place where uh, alcohol consumption is available in indoor places, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Once people, you know, had a few drinks, um, it's really hard not to get friendlier. And, um, you know, so, these are all things we can do. If you want to hang out with your friends, do it outdoors. So those are all things that we each individually can do. But if COVID has shown that our world has these fissures that we're going to have to knit together. There's too much of a gap between the rich and the poor. Our environment has become too degraded. Uh, and we haven't talked about it, but it's the destruction of the environment that's unleashing Yes. Uh, these weird uh, novel uh, pathogens. And, uh, you know, and we uh, have made it too miserable for people who are honest, hardworking people of all colors uh, to be safe in their jobs. And uh, so we have some big structural work to do. And it's going to take, um, you know, it's going to take all of us. Uh, you know, if everybody should vote. <laughs> it's all yeah. I can yeah. say. Yeah. A place. And how people not only become attached to, you know, their social network, yes. but that for all of us, a beloved place yes. has yeah. real meaning to us. That's why displacement has been so painful. Yes. That's mm. what refugees uh, contend with. That's what people who, neighborhoods that were subject to urban renewal, which yes. some people call Negro removal, yes. uh, you know, um, experience, they, they miss yes. the vibrancy of a, of, of a beloved place. And, and a lot of what you talk about um, just reminds me of hearing her talk. Yes. It's interesting how different fields can arrive at uh, oh, yes. this. And we need to support the protection of beloved places and, and make them better. And as you point out, we know how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, in, and in some ways, Mary, I'm also thankful um, to Harvard's Real Science uh, and the Environmental Media Association for thinking that an artist and um, an epidemiologist, mm -hmm. you know, a doctor should talk. And like those kinds of synergy. Yeah and relationships should be more strongly forged. Yes. So please know that you have an ally in me and anything that I can do to, um, to promote um, the, the, the physical health, mm -hmm. the, the, the health agenda, I will do more uh, to do so. Well, it's been a real honor to have a chance to be in conversation with you. And I wanna thank Real Science and for bringing us together and for their work on pointing out uh, climate change, which in many ways is one of the most existential threats of all. Absolutely.